Well, good morning, dear saints. Great to see you again as we gather today, the 12th of November, as we gather our psalm for today is Psalm 137 and the Old Testament, the New Testament reading, chapter 26, the first 19 verses. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. In the morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I prepare sacrifice for you and watch. My mouth is filled with your praise and with your glory all the day. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Well, hear the word of the Lord from the psalm today, and the psalm is challenging. By the waters of Babylon, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows there, we hung up our lyres. For there our captors required of us songs, and our tormentors mirth, saying, Sing of us one of your songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forgive you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its... I'm sorry. If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. Let my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth If I do not remember you, if I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy, remember, O Lord, against the Edomites the day of Jerusalem, how they said, Lay it bare, lay it bare, down to its foundations. O daughter of Babylon, doomed to be destroyed, blessed shall he be who repays you with what you have done to us. Blessed shall be he who takes the little ones and dashes them upon the rocks. This is the word of the Lord. Well, that's not a happy psalm, especially when we look to the end. It really gets our attention, taking babies and dashing them on the rocks. It doesn't sound like at all anything we would want to do or should do. But God, in his righteous judgment, does. Israel writes this psalm while they're in captivity. They're no longer in their land. They are slaves, removed from everything they value. They can't worship God like they want, and their captors make fun of them. Sing us songs, and there's no joy in them. But their hope, even in the midst of this challenging psalm, their hope is in God who will come and he, who, he will avenge them. He will take away their enemies and kill them and set Israel free. Now, this is their hope, as they, Israel's hope in the time that the Jews again would be restored and back to their land. But if we look at it today, dear saints, we are Israel. We are the new Israel through faith given to us in Christ. And we have enemies. We have enemies all around us that would see God's church destroyed or changed so that it is no longer centered in Christ. And one day, in the midst of our struggles and our sorrows, Christ will come back and he will avenge and he will rescue his church, taking her home, his bride, to be holy and pure. And then those who push against the church, those who rail sin, death, and devil himself that push against the hope that we have in Christ, they will meet their final end. They will be destroyed and sent to the fires of hell where they, it will be sealed on that last day, and there will be no more sin, and there will be no more death, And there will no more persecution against you or the church or what we say and believe because Christ will reign on the throne once and for all in peace. Just like the Garden of Eden before sin entered the picture. That is the hope that we have, dear saints. The gospel reading for today is a heavy reading as well. It, uh, we enter in now ta- into that period in the scriptures where they are actively going to kill Jesus. This is Matthew, the 26th chapter. When Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said to the disciples, 
You know that after two days the Passover is coming and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people gathered in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and plotted together in order to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. But they said, Not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. Now when Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster flask of very expensive ointment, and she poured it on his head as he reclined at table. And when the disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, Why this waste? For this could have been sold for a large sum and given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you trouble this woman? For she has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. In pouring this ointment on my body, she has done, it is prepared for me for burial. Truly I say to you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole of the world, what she has done will be told in her memory. Then one of the twelve, whose name was Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What will you give me if I deliver him over to you? And they paid him thirty pieces of silver. And from that moment he sought an opportunity to betray him. Now on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Where will you have us prepare for you the Passover to eat? He said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, here again we see Jesus preparing. We see, what's really interesting here is we see both wanting Jesus' death. We see the scribes, the Pharisees, the chief priest. We see them all arguing and working toward killing Jesus, getting him out of the picture. And we see Jesus wanting his death as well. Not to remove it from suffering, but we see Jesus wanting to go to the cross for us so that we will be forgiven. When we look at this whole thing as Jesus is doing this, we see the the religious establishment working toward the death of Jesus. The religious establishment that knows the law that says you shall not kill or you shall not murder, and yet they're willing to set everything aside. Their hate has bound them so much that they will put aside every rule they have or simply justify their own behavior for doing it, and they will seek to kill the very Son of God. That truly shows you that there is no hope and no faith there, that they are just simply driven by evil and hate. In the midst of this, as this starts to get closer to the time of death, this one woman comes And she anoints Jesus. One jar of very expensive perfume. And she pours it on Jesus' head. An anointing, like in the same way a king was anointed with olive oil on his head. So here Jesus is anointed by this woman. And she is remembered even to this day because of what she did. Gave this wonderful gift, anointed Jesus for his death, because in that, you and I are made holy and pure. No cost to us, all the cost assumed by Jesus. It's interesting when we hear the disciples as they respond to this, you'd think they were stodgy old Germans. This money, it was wasted on Jesus. It it should have been sold to the poor. It should have been sold to feed them thinking of the practical things and not seeing what's actually going on. That Jesus, in a matter of hours, will give his life for you. And that here in this one spot, he is anointed, setting him on the path for the hope and promise of all mankind. Jesus is anointed 
And then we already now enter into Judas. Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve. One of those who has been with Jesus the whole time, he, his greed gets the best of him. There are a few hints through the scripture that Judas was probably embezzling through the funds of the disciples. And here again, Judas goes to see how he can line his pockets. 30 pieces of silver, he agreed with those in the religious leaders that they should pay him that and he will betray. He will hand Jesus' location over so they can arrest him and do what they need to do. Incidentally, 30 pieces of silver is the price that was demanded if someone would kill one of your slaves. That's how they see the life of Jesus, equal with a slave. Not Savior, not King, not Lord, not Messiah, just a slave, just someone we can do away with. Pay the man, get him killed, let's move on. Unbelief is that callous. As Jesus is there with his disciples, he now sets the stage for what we know as Monday, Thursday, the Lord's Supper, and that will give way to arrest, trial, death, resurrection for you. That will give way to our salvation. It's really challenging when we look at this and we see the love of our Savior. We see what he would do for us. But dear saints, that's what love is. Love is setting aside everything of your own, all for the sake of someone else. And that's exactly what Jesus did for you. Forgave you all your sins, so that you one day will be with him. That will be no sorrow. That will be great joy. Well, in this, as we begin, once again, we do the second article of the Apostles' Creed. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. What does this mean? I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord, who has redeemed me, a lost and condemned person, purchased and won me from all sins, from death and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy precious blood and with his innocent suffering and death that I may be his own and live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, just as he is risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, this is most certainly true. We pray. Father, we thank you again that Jesus was so willing to go to the cross for us so that we might be forgiven, so that we might live as his dear children, holy and righteous and serving others. Strengthen us today, dear Father, in that faith you have given to us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I thank you, my heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul in all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, have an enjoyable Tuesday, dear saints. I look forward to joining you again tomorrow. Go in his peace.